Uh, so excited to have you all on today uh, to talk about uh, a pretty boring topic, but with one of my favorite people, uh, Andy Schrader is with us today. Andy, you don't get nearly enough screen time on our webinars. <laughs> I'm the Wizard of Oz. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> We uh we don't get Andy on screen enough, so we're excited to do it today. Um, we're talking about that. There, I will I would posit there's nobody in the country that knows more about this incredibly nuanced, boring topic of pledge card logistics, gift processing, uh, the vendors that are out there, what you can do internally and externally, everything else. Um, so that's what we're talking about today. Housekeeping items. Yes, we are recording it. Uh, yes, we will send you an email with the slides when we're done. I'll probably have that by the end of today, if not by tomorrow morning. Uh, if you have questions, hit the Q&A button on the screen. Don't put them in the chat. We always lose track of the chat because people start talking and we lose the questions. If you put it in the Q&A, then it will pop up on our screen. And if we don't answer you, it's because we, we, we chose not to answer you. So you know to get offended. If you hit it in the Q&A button, you know that we ignored your question. If you put it in the chat, we can say, oh, we just missed it. Um, Andy, any other housekeeping items? Anything I'm missing? No, I think we're ready to rock and roll. So buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> wild ride through lock boxes, banks, gift processors. Uh, my favorite Andy story, since he doesn't come on here nearly enough, is uh, PSG, as you know, we're about five years old. Uh, in the early days, we had to have a website. And we didn't have enough photos of our team like working with clients. So Andy was down in Phoenix working with one of our clients. We're like, hey, really need you to send back some photo. Like you sitting at a table like with a client, like working, doing normal stuff. And the only photo that we got back was this one, uh, which was unusual anywhere. It was Andy doing a jumping chest bump with one of our clients. Like that was his solution to for us to be able to put something on the website about, you know, we're trying to look professional and all that. So um, that image comes to mind every time I, I put your, your headshot on the uh, screen here, Andy. <laughs> uh, okay, background. Uh, PSG, who we are. Uh, we are a small but mighty uh, boutique consulting firm. We do fundraising consulting. Uh, we run annual appeals. Uh, our clients are largely Catholic dioceses. That's kind of the niche that we serve. So we run annual appeals that raise $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, big complex fundraising appeals. And as we do that, we learn a whole heck of a lot about technology and everything we learn we share with the world here. Uh, we also offer Razor's Edge uh, database administration. So there's a whole lot of large organizations that outsource their Razor's Edge database role to us. And we do some fundraising automation, which actually we'll talk about. Most of you that are on the line as I look through the list of names here are also subscribers and customers of one of our products. So in addition to doing fundraising consulting, we invented this super handy little tool called Ask Genius. Uh, and again, there might be a couple of people that aren't using it yet. Uh, if you're not using it yet, uh, you should check it out. Uh, it's pretty great. It does one really, really useful thing, and that's it. And that is it sets the perfect ask amount for everybody that's on your mailing list. So if you're fundraising and you're looking at sending out mailing to 1,000 people or 10,000 people or 100,000 people, you want to make sure you're asking everybody for the exact right amount. Ask Genius is the tool we built to do exactly that. Uh, you don't have to take our word for it. Uh, you can just read the Wall Street Journal. Uh, a couple months back, they came out with this big bombshell story about how to get people to donate more money to charity. And the answer was set better ask amounts, set personalized ask amounts, custom to each donor. That's what Ask Genius does. Topic of today. How about this for transition? We're talking about Ask Genius and pledge cards and ask amounts, Andy. Mm -hmm. Really, when we talk about gift processing, we're talking about pledge cards. Okay. So on our screen, we have one of the templates I think that we shared with the world of what a good looking pledge card uh, can be. This is the front of it. You'll notice that little scan line over there. You'll notice it's got the person's name on here. This is a good, if you're in, if you're talking about gift processing, this is a good looking pledge card because it's got a scan line. Your life might be a little bit easier. On the back, you've got a spot for them to fill out their email address and input some stuff. When we're talking about gift processing, Andy, is it correct that really we're just talking about like who gets the, who ingests this data, right? All the fundraisers mail them out and then gift processing is just a process like bringing that in. Is that fair? That's exactly right. So you sent this up to capture the information and when you get the information back, it needs to go somewhere because it does nothing on that piece of paper. So it's get, getting it from there to somewhere. Yes. And and like all, we're all very, as, as fundraising professionals, we're great at asking for money, right? We, we obsess over it, how to ask people, how to cultivate relationships, all of that. Many of us, myself included, are not wired to think about the other side of the, the ledger, right? Like 
asking is the fun part. That's the exciting part, raise the money. But it's big and complicated to input all those gifts, get the data in the right place, make sure that the gifts are acknowledged the right way, that pledges are set up, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the topic today. You really have a couple options, right? When we're talking about gift processing. Um, and by the way, if you have specific questions, put them in the Q&A. I know uh, tons of people are saying, hey, have you heard of this vendor? Or have you, you know, could we do X, Y, Z? We, we will, today's gonna be a little bit more free flowing than normal, um, just because we have Andy here. So make sure to hit us up with your questions. Really from a very high level overview, your options are two, right? You can use a vendor to do this for you, which means you send out your fundraising material or your printer does, and then all of those reply pledge cards and checks and everything else go to a vendor. Yep, that's option one. Option two is you can do it in-house. You can do it internally using, uh, if you do it in-house, we're really talking about using full-time employees uh, or even temps or seasonal workers, right? So mm -hmm. depending on the volume of gifts, if they come in nice and even throughout the year, you can probably plan for that in your development staff. If you're like many of our clients where you have a huge spike in certain months, you might want to bring in some temps and we'll talk through the pros and cons of all this, okay? If you're using a vendor, there's three to our knowledge, right? There's really three groups of vendors that you can use. And we're going to walk through each of these and we're going to talk about what we've learned, you know, what it's like working with them. Okay. So we can start here. Uh, using a bank to process gifts. Uh, the first thing we'll find, and then Andy, I'll have you go through the bullets here. Yeah. Um, we are, <laughs> PSG, Ask Genius, we, we always give it to you straight, right? We don't, we don't uh, sugarcoat things. The truth of the matter is we find that most banks, and I say most, there are exceptions, and we're going to give kudos to some banks to do a great job. Most banks that we work with overpromise and underdeliver in this department, right? Um, what happens is that many times the CFO of your nonprofit will say, hey, we I know we have to acknowledge these gifts, or we have these gifts coming in. Why don't we just, uh, I was talking to our banker today, we we're having, you know, we're on the golf course with a banker, and he said, hey, you know, we could probably process those gifts for you. So often it's from an existing relationship with your nonprofit. Um, Andy, walk us through these next three bullets here. I mean, what is it that makes banks, when it goes wrong, why does it go wrong? Um, it, it goes wrong because you. it's very black and white. So when we think about when, when a bank gets it, they need to know step by step what to do. If you get it in your place, you're, you can kind of interpret things and you understand the gray. A bank is... It's this or it's not this. And so, you know, as you're sending it to the bank, if it's not even a little bit not this, um, they won't touch it, right? So you're paying the bank to do the work and ultimately they're going to say, we couldn't help on this one, we couldn't help on this one, we couldn't help on this one. And then you're left, um, you know, to do some of that work, right? So so maybe spell that a little bit more clearly. So when a bank gets it, talk about how they scan it and then talk about exception files. Like maybe yep. that'll help. Yeah. So when the bank gets it, um, oftentimes they're the first thing that they're going to do is scan. And, and Nick, when you showed the pledge card before, there was that barcode on there. So the barcode is one option. The other option is something that we call uh, an OCR scan line or, you know, op optical character recognition, which is, you know, anybody that has a checking account on um, the check on the bottom of that, all those numbers, that's an OCR scan line, right? So they're going to run that through and that's going to capture the majority of the information. In addition to that, uh, in most lockbox situations, they're going to look at the gift amount. So did the person give hundred dollars? And then they're gonna look at the pledge card to determine is this amount that they're giving the first gift of a 10 month pledge or a 12 month pledge? Is it a new gift or is it simply a, a payment on a, on a gift that already exists? So is it a pledge payment? Those are the kinds of things that they're trying to identify, you know, really as they process those individual gifts. The, right. the majority of it is going to be that kind of baked in information within that scan line. So the biographic information, donor ID number, name, address, you know, those kinds of things, often a campaign appeal. It's it's the additional things that they're having to interpret, which, like I said, one time gift, pledge, recurring payment, those kinds of things. Right. So so whether it's a bank or, or a printer that does caging services or a provider, essentially, they're ingesting all this stuff. They're scanning it to try and pull out the data they need. And then they're giving the nonprofit an Excel file or CSV file, like, hey, here's the stuff that you can upload into Razor's Edge or Virtuous or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So that's so there's that. And then on the other end, it's if something's wonky, they send you a link and you have to like, hey, somebody wrote on the pledge card, we can't scan it and we don't know what to do with it. So it goes in the exception files. Banks generally have way more exceptions than the other two vendors because yep. banks are set up to if they're doing this they're used to what like you know like water bills or like remittances exactly yeah like things where like 
everything's always in the exact same spot, right? Like if they, they, so they set up an optical scanner and they say, if there's any ink in this exact pixel on the thing, then do this. And of course, real life is messier, right? So I don't think banks really anticipate how messy it can be, especially if you're a nonprofit that has, it's one thing for direct mail cards that go out that have the scan lines like Andy was talking about, mm -hmm. but it's another when you're like at an event, you know, and somebody's filling out a pledge card like at an auction or something, or for our, our diocesan clients that are doing, you know, in pew in the middle of church, like people filling out a card, that's just handwriting, right? That's messy and, and things get wonky. So you don't want to choose a bank that's not prepared for that because all that's going to happen is they're going to get all your mail. They're going to open it. And then you're going to get all of that same thing as an exception file. And you're going to have to do it by hand anyway. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? It, it is fair. And, and yeah. we've actually, and for some of the clients that we work with, as we've helped them kind of determine this, um, that's one of the things that we really push on is, you know, really limiting the amount of exceptions because the expectation is that they're going to do the work. So if they're not set up to do the work or if they start the work and we realize that there's an overwhelming amount of exceptions, we need to figure out why they're not able to process those. And if we need to adjust, you know, kind of the rules on our end or go back to them and explain in all of these instances, this is what you need to do. It generally clears it up. Um, but yeah, it's a, it is, that's, that's the challenge, most challenging part, I think, is, is really monitoring those exceptions and making sure that they're doing the vast majority of the work. And if, and if I seem a little chippy on this topic, it's only because we have had this happen so many times with large, sophisticated nonprofits that ask a local or a regional bank to do this. And the bank promises, says, absolutely, we can do it. And nine out of 10 times, they can't. And what happens is you've, you've, you've moved over to them, you've got everything set up, you're in the middle of an appeal, and then you find out that the bank can't do any of the thing. Like they can't handle the handwriting, they can't handle the stuff. And then you're stuck, right? That's a really tough spot to be in for a nonprofit. So with that, there are some that do a good job with this, mm -hmm. okay? So I wanna make sure we highlight, Andy, who are who are the three that, that we've worked with that uh, do a good job? Yeah, so um, Bank of Oklahoma, which most people know probably more as BOK, um, has done a great job with a lot of our clients. Um, they offer a lot of opportunities to customize what you're doing. So it's not just kind of a, hey, we offer the lockbox service and this is exactly what it is. Um, they've really done a great job of working with the clients that that we've uh, you know been able to, to partner with for them um, and really create kind of a customized um, lockbox plan for them. Farmers Merchant Bank, same way. Um, when we talked, Nick, you, you talked before kind of about those one-offs, you know, the event gift card processing, um, or the pledge card processing at an event or, you know, some sort of gala or something like that. Um, and then obviously the NPU, um, they've been able to basically take that information without the donor's ID on there and using VLOOKUP through Excel, identify the donor that goes to the pledge card and then are able to process it that way to make sure that we're um, attributing that gift to the, the correct person. And then Pinnacle Bank is another one um, very early on as we started working with lockboxes. Um, that comes to mind and they continue to do a great job and deliver for the clients for sure. And if there's others also, I mean, people who come to all of our webinars know we're collaborative. If, there's, if you're working with a great bank, let us know. We're happy mm -hmm. to plug them. So, so PSG has no dog in this fight. We just work as the middleman between a whole bunch of clients that are looking for good service. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we can align them with a bank that does a great job, we're happy to do so. And I, and I will say, Nick, um, you know, because many of the, the organizations out there probably have a banking relationship with their their local bank. So some of them will flat out tell you this is not something we do and they might be able to recommend a provider to you um, and they're OK. Uh, you know, that earlier slide when we talk about they overpromise, it's they're overpromising because they do not want to lose that banking relationship with you. Right. And that means yeah. they don't want you to take all of your funds and move them to another institution because that's not good for them. Um, and so it is really making sure that they have they not just that they have the service, but they have the service that actually fits your needs. And, and that's an important conversation to have. Yep. And and some of the dynamic, too, is sometimes hear me out. The nonprofit finance office doesn't understand fully the amount of work and the complexity of processing gifts either. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So sometimes if finance is like, oh, we really want to use the bank, they'll be fine. How hard can it be? And then you get into it and it's like, well, it could be a one-time gift, a recurring gift, a pledge mm -hmm. payment, a new pledge. You know, it could be handwriting. It could be all this other stuff. Like it gets pretty complex pretty quick. Well, and that is, that's, that's the issue. And, and hopefully there are no finance people on, on this call, <laughs> but maybe there are, I don't, I don't know. I'm right? looking through the list here to see who I just Right. Remember. So, so their main concern is that the check gets to the lockbox, that the check is deposited in the right account or to the right fund. That that's where their job begins and ends. The money is there, check the balances. We're good to go. 
from the development side, from the data, the data processor side, the database administrator, they need to know not just that the amount of the gift was this, but what fund did it go to? You know, is it a soft credit or is it a hard credit? You know, is it for this particular campaign? You know, is this a, a pledge? Is this a one-time gift? You know, all of those, you know, kinds of things are important things that the lockbox should be capturing for you um, more than just, hey, we got a hundred dollars and we put it in your account. Yep. And is this Bob Smith or is this Bob Smith Jr.? Is that the same person? I mean, there's so much that mm -hmm. goes into it. So let, let's get into a little bit more about using a printer. So that's that's banking. So summarize banking. Yes, there are some good ones. We we called out three that we think are worthy of praise because we have clients who use them and are happy and they and they get it and they dig in. There's lots, the smaller the bank, generally the less likely it is that they truly understand what you're going to need and are able to do it. So now let's talk about printers that also process gifts, okay? Um, the big takeaway there, and by the way, great questions. Emily, uh, Noel, Margaret uh, in the in the Q&A, great questions. We're going to tackle those in, in a minute here. So, so keep adding those questions into the Q&A as we go. Um, this will be pretty valuable. Okay, so you can use a bank. We've talked through that. You could also use a printer. Um, the big takeaway for this, printers are a decent option uh, and, and generally better than a bank. Um, but they're rare. There's not a whole lot of them that do this, that that handle the the outbound printing and mailing, as well as the the receding, the caging, things like that. The good news is, if you find one, right? If your direct mail vendor, if you use one, does this, you're going to be in a good spot because they do understand the complexity and they understand messy handwriting, right? Printers get it. They're the ones designing your pledge card, or at least printing your pledge card. They understand segmentation. They're the ones who are putting probably that that OCR scan line. On the card, so they mm -hmm. if they're the uh, if they're the ones that are designing it for outbound, that's a good thing. If they're also the one that have to ingest the information, because they're going to take care to make sure that everything is exactly how it should be. Um, Andy, anything I missed here on printers, good, bad, or ugly? Yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I don't think so. You know, one of the things that we have found for the for the printers that do this kinds of stuff, right? Many of them will require that they both print and process your stuff, right? So if, if you're going with a certain vendor, they're, you may not be able to use your local printer to print your pledge cards and those sorts of things to then ultimately send them to that organization and have them process it. They're gonna That's say, we will process our own thing. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not a bad thing, right? But if, if you're an organization that has a, a good relationship with a, a local print shop and they're you know, a pretty healthy donor to your organization, there might be some friction as you consider moving away from them to other options. Solid point. And, and it probably impacts banks as well. So both these first two categories, if they're not a specialized, this is all we do thing, the strings will be attached, right? The printer is going to want all of your print business. The bank is going to want all of your deposits there if they're also offering this. This is not their main thing. It's sort of an add-on service. Um, one other thing we found using printers um, uh, as lock boxes is one of my favorite old chestnuts there. Uh, this, this, according to Google, is attributed to Mark Twain, but then I also saw like Roosevelt and a bunch of others. So I have no idea who said it, but when, you, when your only tool is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And this has proven true in a couple of situations working with printers who are also uh, the GIF processors. And here's where it, it comes to, to, to play. Um, the solution to a printer to almost anything is always to print more, right? Like to include more inserts, uh, to not move things online. There's lots of our clients who rightly are promoting online giving. They send out the direct mail because it's still a direct mail heavy activity, but then they put on QR codes and encourage people to go online to make their gifts. Generally speaking, a printer is going to say, oh, we don't need that. You know, let's just make sure that they can put a return envelope and, and send it back in. Uh, so a lot of times they'll discourage you from 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 promoting online giving. They'll they'll insist that you put like credit card information on the reply slip, which you shouldn't do. Um, some other things have have come up, right? Again, but it's all manageable. But they get it, and if that's the only thing you have to deal with, is that sometimes they want to make you print too much. You know, so be it. Okay, so that is printers. Now let's talk about using a gift processing firm. So this is uh, a company whose sole job is this, right? So they're not printing on the side. They're not a bank. They're just like, we exist to ingest fundraising pledge cards and checks and handle it for um, nonprofits. The big takeaway is that they know the drill. If you're using a firm like this, they're going to be sophisticated, you know, maybe even painfully. So if you're a small nonprofit, 
that conversation that you have with a with a gift processor is going to blow your mind. Like the number of questions they ask you um, mm -hmm. can be overwhelming. And that just shows. I mean, they typically they understand the requirements better than anyone. Bad news. Almost every, I don't even know if I need to say almost, Andy. It appears <laughs> that every single gift processor that does this, you know, this is their full-time job, is located in D.C. or Baltimore or somewhere on the East Coast. I assume, Andy, that's because that's where most of the national large mega nonprofits and political campaigns are at. I think so. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not even, I mean, it's East Coast, yes, but it's also, you know, kind of Upper East Coast, you know, basically down I should have just all, put, yeah. all the way down to D.C. And that, that's about where it stops. Yeah. So so that's frustrating. And it's frustrating to us because our clients are all across the country. We have clients in, in California and in Texas and everywhere in between that don't want to send mail all the way across the country. Right. And, and it's really frustrating because in many cases, this is your best option. If you want it done right and professional and somebody who really gets it and can be sophisticated in their approach, you have to choose between that or if you're in California, you know, an extra day and a half or two days of mail time, which is which for our clients can be tough. Um, it also takes a little bit of time to get up and running because they understand how complex it is. They generally want to do it right. This is not a decision, Andy, that a nonprofit CEO can wake up in the morning and say, hey, <laughs> I'm so frustrated. Uh, those those bumpkins, you know, messed up our last mailing. We need a new gift processor, you know, by the end of the month. Mm -hmm. It takes a while. Is four to six months. Is that accurate? And it is. I mean, and there are some that can do it sooner. And I mean, we've we've seen some that, you know, might say, hey, it's really like an eight to 10 week, you know, sort of process. And that is assuming everything goes right, right? So you want to make sure that things are tested, that we talked about those scan lines, that the machines that the that the organization has are reading your scan lines appropriately, that whoever is printing those materials are printing them, you know, with enough margin around that scan line so that there's not anything else that's being picked up. But yeah, I would say generally you got to plan on a couple months. So with a lot of our clients that we're working with now, we're setting things up to start either with their end of the year mailing in November or December, or, you know, we're starting to look into January, February of next year to implement some of these new, you know, lockbox, um, uh, the code. Yeah. And, and it occurs to me, maybe a way to think about it too, is like a gift processor and we'll, we'll drop some names here in a minute on ones that, that we're talking about their scanning is going to be more sophisticated, right? It's going to, in many cases, be able to pick up handwriting and do some of the sophisticated stuff you should be able to do in the year 2023. Contrast that with a bank who also does gift processing. Their scanner is going to be able to say, if this box in this exact position is checked, you know, then do something, right? So it's 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 just a different level of sophistication that you run into. Um, one other thing I'd mentioned just about the, the gift processors, Changes to pledge cards need a lot of time. Oh, and this is really applies to all of them, truthfully. But once you're using an outside vendor and not doing it internally, it's not an easy matter to like move where the donor's name is on the card or the information you're putting on a card or the scan line. So you you know there's a lot more moving parts. It's a it's a shift that takes a long time to turn, yada yada. And then I'd also just say, you know, mistakes still happen. Andy, what what are examples? Um, we've been in this a long time. We've seen <laughs> great, we've seen crazy stuff. Like, what are some examples of things that can happen with with any of these vendors? Um, yeah, I mean, they're they're my gosh, there are so many different things. Um, let's not know, scare people, everybody off, but let's give them I, a yeah. re realistic assessment of what I'm looking make. at. Participant numbers like start to dwindle as as we started talking about this. But no, um, you know, in terms of the check, so we've had instances where. Um, a check has maybe been captured twice. So um, in a situation, they scan the check, they put it into a deposit file, but then also manually keyed in that information. So, you know, inadvertently did that twice. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, and probably, you know, for sure for a lot of our diocesan clients, the one that we see most frequently is they process that gift and they're not attributing it to an existing pledge. So a month or two months later, when you send a pledge reminder for that individual, the amount that they still owe you hasn't changed, even though they may have sent in a $250 or $500 pledge payment. Sometimes, you know, the, the donors can get angry there. Um, those probably are the most significant, yeah. you know, issues. Yeah. And every now and then some mail stuff, right? So like the, these organizations, if they're they're specialized, they're doing this for a whole bunch of nonprofits, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to have a, a Tyvek envelope with pledge cards from your donors that, that came in. Sometimes those get out of order, right? Or maybe, you know, you just processing time. Like, hey, do you have more bags there? Where are we at? As a fundraiser, you're always looking to see, okay, I know where we are now. How much, you know, money is sitting at the at the cage? You know, how much has been sent to our gift processor? 
So sometimes you got to work through that. Let's talk about cost. I know everybody wants to know what do these things cost? Um, a million dollars. <laughs> so as I understand it, Andy, this is based on, on, on volume, yep. on, on the number of gifts that they're going to, that, that are going, whether it's a bank or a printer or a gift processor, the number of gifts that they're going to receive and then what you want them to do with them. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Okay. So yep. in general, what are we talking? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it varies, but it could be anywhere between 20 and 60 cents a piece. And you might say, well, that's that's not a lot. Well, no, but I mean, some of those gifts are going to be a two dollar or a five dollar gift and you're paying 20 or 60 cents. Payments. Yeah, payments might be slow. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in instances where it does come as a direct mail response and the majority of that donor information is captured in that scan line that we were talking about earlier, that's that's a situation where the individual processing that gift, because even if it's a machine, there's still some human intervention that happens in the processing of that gift. So the the less uh, a person has to do in terms of keying in um, our keystrokes is a lot of times when you're setting up um, a lockbox contract, you will talk about price per keystroke. And the more that you can have a machine capture, the less keystroke that can, is going to drive down your price. So where you start to see the higher price and you get close to that 60 cents is the information is not captured. You need a human to actually look up some of that, you know, information right. in a in a data file that the organization has sent to determine that Andy Schrader is actually the person that gave this gift and his donor ID is one, two, three, four, five, six, and you know, those kinds of things. All that has to be manually keyed in there. That's where you start to get a little bit more of an increased price yeah. on that. But so yeah, in general, and th there are other factors that kind of figure into that, but uh, we have an example here that we talked about it. Yep. So to give people a sense, so 20, 60 cents per piece. Now, reminder, that's not just gifts. That could also be payments, right? If you're having them take in payments on people, if you're doing a big campaign and there's pledges. So in general, you know, a nonprofit of, of moderate to large size, you know, bringing in $48 million, four to $8 million a year might pay 30 to 50 grand, right? To a gift processor. So some of the things that can, this is where Andy was going, which is why I put that up so I can get to the next slide. Things that impact your gift processing, right? Um, and you'll get a contract that says, if this happens, here's what it costs. If we do this, mm -hmm. then here's what it costs. So it's very, you know, business processes is the, the term that Andy uses a bunch. Um, if it has a scan line, Andy, it's going to cost less for them to yep. process than if it's a handwritten card. Is that right? Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, if we want them to capture email addresses, this is a big thing for a lot of our clients. We spend a great deal of effort and so should you, uh, <laughs> nonprofit viewers, collecting email addresses, making sure that we know who that donor is so we can thank them. We can tell them how great they are. We can do all sorts of fun stuff with their email. But if we want somebody to type that in by hand, that's going to cost money. Looking up constituent ID numbers, this is what Andy was talking about. When they're processing direct mail, it's easy. If you're a sophisticated nonprofit or even a not a sophisticated nonprofit these days, you have a scan line on there that tells them exactly who the donor is. If they're filling out a card, uh, a pledge card, because of they're at an in-pew event, or they're at a, um, sorry, they're at a, an auction, or they're filling it out in church or at, at a school gym, whatever it is, you can ask them to take that handwritten document, it says Bill Smith on it, go and look up against a flat file of all your constituents and try and find and match up that ID number. So that way you can get your Excel file and upload it to Razor's Edge. Mm -hmm. That's a process not everybody wants to do. So be, be aware of that. Printing and postage. Uh, Andy, do a lot of our clients use their gift processor to also send gift acknowledgements? Um, I definitely, a lot of the larger organizations, I mean, people that are, you know, you're, we're talking about tens of thousands of gifts in terms of volume a year. Um, it is easier a lot of times for, for the gift processor to just turn around and then do the acknowledgement of those gifts right away. Um, it certainly expedites the, the time. And we talk about the gold standard of 24 to 48 hours once a gift's been processed to, to acknowledge that gift. Um, that's not as easy to do in small shops of one, you know, one and two people. So having a gift processor doing it for you um, is certainly worth that. It might cost you, you know, an additional 50 cents per piece, but you're going to delight the donors because they're going to see that their checking count is less than it was, you know, the day before when, before you had that gift and they're going to get that thank you within, you know, a matter of a couple of days and, and feel good about that as well. Yep. Love it. Uh, there's always fees, anything anymore. So lots of times you get charged a PO box fee. Uh, digital storage fee, Andy, you want to talk about document retention quick? Yeah. And so, um, this is, this is kind of a, a critical one and dependent upon the lockbox, some of them have this kind of baked into the fee. Others will give you the opportunity to do the storage yourself or allow them to do it. And if they do it, they charge you kind of a fee for their server space or whatever. But essentially 
um, once the, once you send the pledge card in and they've scanned it, they digitally captured what that donor commitment is, right? The amount, you know, kind of all the information. And so from an IRS standpoint, somebody, you need to be able as an organization to retain that information for up to seven years should the donor come back and need it. And it's probably easier for the organization, for the lockbox to be able to store that digitally and simply give you access you know, in terms of a portal or something like that, where you can click on the specific gift date or batch or something like that and access that scan should you need to recreate it or, you know, reprint it for a donor. That's what we're talking about in a digital storage fee. Great. And sometimes a wire fee, right, for them. If it's not a financial institution that's doing this, they might, may charge you a wire fee to actually deposit and send the funds over. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, so that's that's gift processing vendors. Uh, a couple more slides here, and then I want to get to all the people ask such great questions here. So keep the questions coming. Um uh, as we go. So if you're, if you're processing gifts in-house, right? Um, so we've talked about using an outside vendor. And this was actually a question that came up here. I'll jump in um, about sort of the pros and cons, like why would you use an outside vendor um, versus processing in-house? And, and maybe Andy, I'll, I'll just start there. Yeah. I mean, help me think through that decision, like in, as we have for so many clients, why would you consider going out versus having staff? Um, so I think, you know, a couple things, and I've been a part of organizations that, you know, we did all the gift processing in-house. And then we had a very large capital campaign and knew that we were essentially, in terms of a people standpoint, we were at capacity of what we could do without knowing that there were going to be thousands of additional gifts coming in in this capital campaign. And so we initially reached out to try to secure a lockbox specifically to process those capital campaign gifts because we just didn't feel that we had the staff time. I mean, we didn't want gifts sitting there for three, four, five days in a desk drawer because we didn't have time to actually process them. So, you know, it really was to expedite the processing, you know, the timing of the processing. Um, and so we allowed that. And ultimately we were very happy with how the, the vendor did that, that we moved our annual appeal processing along with the capital campaign processing all to, you know, that particular entity. I think that's probably, um, you know, would be the largest as to why you would, would, would kind of uh, push it away is just the human piece of it. Yep. Uh, a couple of the reasons that we have clients that move to a vendor, if the workload's uh, unpredictable, right? If you're getting the same amount of volume every month, no big deal. You just staff for it and everything's good. But if you have a couple key appeal points throughout the year and you just get deluged, deluged? Deluged, yeah. <laughs> deluged? Yeah. <laughs> In the chat, let us know how to pronounce the word that I just tried there. If you <laughs> if you get overwhelmed with, with gifts that are coming in in a, in a short time frame, it can help to have to put some bodies on it, right? People that are professionals that know what they're doing, they're able to get through that because the most important thing is that it's accurate and the donor feels that love, right? The donor mm -hmm. knows that their gift was received, they get the thank you note. So it's 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 volume, and then it's also security, right? So the rules are um, different when you get money involved, right? This is not something you can just come up with your own system. If you have credit card numbers sitting on pieces of paper. There's certain rules in order for you to be PCI compliant and in order for your auditors to be happy with what you're doing. You may not be able to process in-house unless you have a separate area, right, Andy, that's 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 locked. I mean, there's all sorts of requirements that your auditors are going to want to make sure that you're following. And it is true. And I mean, I, I can tell you, I actually serve on a, a board for a financial institution and the regulations that continue to come out as more and more of these very large corporations have data breaches are just going to continue to, to grow to the point where small nonprofits, it's going to be virtually impossible for you to adhere to all of these regulations to be able to process credit card gifts in the traditional form of having a donor write out the information on the credit card or the credit card information on a pledge card and sending it to you. The auditors are going to say, where are you getting that? Who sees it? How are you storing it? You know, is it shredded? Or do you have it in a you know file cabinet? You know, those kinds of, and you could get dinged and fined significant amounts of dollars, like hundreds of thousands of dollars for not being compliant in these organizations or in this situation, which would sink an organization. Who, who Who's handling cash? What happens if people send cash in the door? Are you allowing, like people having their phones? Can they take a screenshot of somebody's credit card number? Like it's, yeah. in, in many cases, it's been driven with just overall a move towards professional security, like outsource that risk, right? Put that mm -hmm. risk on somebody else who's, who's, got a caging situation with cameras and you know locked doors and all that stuff. And I think that that's the big thing, right? So we know that in many of these financial institutions, you know, and, and gift processors and the print the print shops that we're talking about, you know, those gifts are being opened. Multiple people are present. They have cameras, you know, I mean, it's all recorded. And your small organization, you know, you 
that's not necessarily what's happening. And not, and I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't trust the people you work with, right? But um, the controller is going to say, well, there are not enough controls to verify that, you know, it's safe and we we can't, there are too many unknowns if, if money were to go missing that we would have to point a lot of fingers in a lot of places. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, tons of good questions coming in. A uh, couple other thoughts here. So now software vendors, Andy, so I, I'm old enough to remember there's a time. So if even if you didn't outsource to a vendor, there were still like programs you could buy, right? So like mm -hmm. there was, you know, you could have software. If you're going to process them in-house, it'd be software that would help you do that. Is that still the case? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, we've got uh, people who we work with in, in that realm as well. I'm actually working with a client right now that's looking at, they process everything in-house. They're looking for a more efficient way to do that. They're currently hiring temps and it's, you know, it's a very slow manual hunt and peck on the keyboard sort of a process. Um, AQ2 Technologies is one of the partners that, uh, you know, we've recently worked with. They provide the software, right? So you still have all the control of who's opening the mail, how how often the mail is being opened. Um, but essentially the, the scanner that I talked about before where we're running the, the pledge card through that scanner and it's reading the scan line and we're running the checks through the scanner and it's reading all that information, that technology exists for you as a nonprofit to be able to do those things. And so there are places that will actually provide that software to you, provide those scanners. You know, you obviously have a license agreement, but then in addition, they're actually setting up a lockbox implement, like a coding program for you, right? So you're being able to say on that scanner, this is what you're reading and this is what all of these things mean. So when you kick out the, the output file, column A is the donor ID, column B is the gift amount, column C is the fund and you know those kinds of things. Um, and again, it, it allows you to have the efficiencies of a lockbox, but you still, you're not relinquishing that control, right? You still have the control over all of the things and it allows you as those exceptions we talked about, those kind of weird one-off things, you can manage those in real time, you know, as they're being scanned, it, it might kick something out saying, hey, you need to take a look at this. So it sounds like that's sort of an in-between. So you could like lowest level, like open all the things and input them straight into Razor's Edge or Virtuous mm -hmm. kind of one-off as it is. Yep. On the other end, you can just have all of it go to a gift process yep. somewhere else. And this is sort of in-between that you can, if you have a large volume, you can get more sophisticated where you're opening in batches, scanning things through, using yep. software to then generate a file that you upload. Yep. Okay. And then you and take that, that file and essentially import it into your database. Yep. And, and I, I want to plug ones that are good. So what was the company that you said that we've been AQ2 working with? AQ2 Technologies, yep. AQ2. Um, AQ2, yep. And then let's go back, because I think I missed on the specific gift processors. What are some that we've worked with that have done a good job? Um, more, uh, more response group. So more uh, RMG. Um, yep. We've worked with. Uh, there's Agilus is out there. They're out of Albert Lee, Minnesota. So that's yep. kind of a Midwestern option. Uh, Deluxe is out there. Yep. From Portland, and they're, Maine. they're over, they're one of those East coast processors that we talked about up, right. up right. in Maine. Um, those, those are the three we see most on the yep. printer side, LCI letter concepts is one that a lot of our DOS and clients use. Mm -hmm. If we think of more, we'll, we'll certainly plug them. And if you, <laughs> if we think of additional ones, we'll certainly plug them and, and let people know. Also let us know in the chat. If you work with a, one of these vendors, that's great. Again, we, this is our model is, is every time we learn something, we, we share it with the world. Um, mm -hmm. One other thing I guess I want to mention before we go too far, and then we'll take all the questions and answers. Um, a lot of our clients uh, are using our, a tool that we built for this purpose. And when we're talking about processing gifts, PSG does not process gifts. We do not play that role for anyone. But we do have a tool called Automate Genius that can help you acknowledge gifts, right, in a really cool way. So I wanted to share an example of this because I know everybody's been asking. Uh, and while I do that, Andy, if you don't mind looking through the Q&A, we've got a lot of stuff yep. there. Look through that and, and and serve me up in a minute. So what Automate Genius can do. So if you are using, if you're processing gifts in-house, or if you're using a bank or a printer or a gift processor, you can use Automate Genius to connect Razor's Edge to any of your really cool software programs and do some amazing things. On topic today, I want to show how some people are using this for gift acknowledgements and thank you letters. Okay. So imagine a world where a donor makes a gift. Your job as a nonprofit is to do the gift acknowledgements, right? To tell them we received your gift and tell them you're fantastic. You know, well, here's how we're going to use your gift. Do all this great stuff. You know, maybe shoot them an email. So with Automate Genius, you can do that by email. You can do it by hard copy. So what we have clients doing, sorry, I'm moving fast here. When a gift comes in and it hits your razor's edge, software, you can auto-generate an email from your development director or from a major gift officer, from anybody who owns that donor as a portfolio to draft 
an email to that donor. So it just shows up. If I'm a major gift officer at Creighton University, a gift comes in, I open up my laptop in the morning and I have an email drafted from me to Susan because Susan made a gift the night before. That just happens automatically. That's the power of automation. It is going to change your nonprofit, whether you're having us help you with it or you're setting it up on your own. You can do things like, hey, if a gift is above $5,000, let's draft an email to be sent specifically to the donor. If it's below $5,000, let's just automate a process where the email goes out automatically. Okay, so that's on the email side. On the letter side, again, some people are using gift, processor to send, gift processors to send letters and acknowledgements. You can do a bunch of this in-house now in a really personalized way. So we have clients that are setting up automations that as gifts come in, Automate Genius will create the thank you letter for each individual donor. Uh, not a big deal if you're sending everybody the exact same thank you letter. But if you're a university, again, think of my alma mater, Creighton University, when a gift comes in, there might be 40 different thank you letters to choose from, whether that person made a donation to athletics or arts and sciences, or you know who should sign the letter. Uh, should it be the athletic director? Should it be the dean of the College of Arts and Science? What campaign did they give to? What fund did they give to? All of those factors are at play when you're doing gift acknowledgements. So you can unload this whole thing to a gift processor, or you can use Automate Genius internally to generate those letters as they happen. What's nice about the way that <laughs> what's nice about the way that we do it is when gifts come in, it generates the letter and it goes and it puts them in a folder. And then once a day, uh, every two days, once a week, whatever schedule you set up, you just get an email that says, hey, by the way, your letters are ready to go. Just click here to print your letters. And by the way, we also created the envelopes for you. If you want that, click here to print the envelopes. Um, that's a pretty amazing way that nonprofits are getting more sophisticated uh, about how they acknowledge gifts, the attention they show to donors. Of course, then you can even get more specific. You can say, if a donor is above $5,000, route that email to the president's assistant and say, hey, please print these off and have the president of our organization send them a note. Um, the letter can be varied by any of the things that are out there. So I just wanted to highlight that quick um, uh, from Automate Genius. One final thing, when you use Automate Genius, you can also automatically note that, um, uh, you, you can automatically mark that the gifts work now inside of Razor's Edge. It's a huge pain in the butt uh, if you're using an outside vendor to have to go back into Razor's Edge and mark who got the thank you letter and all that, you can automate that whole process. If you if you haven't seen that yet, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, it's being used in the wild right now. Uh, our friend Chrissy uh, in West Virginia is using this. Uh, everybody that's used Razor's Edge can't believe how much more you can do now through automation. Um, okay, final slide on automation that I want to share because it's I'm telling you guys, if you haven't started using automation, your nonprofit, it's huge. It's huge. This is what's coming. We're still in a world where, you know, gift processing is important and you have manual labor involved, but what you can automate in terms of the donor love and attention is incredible. So even just something as simple as this, if you have as your nonprofit Slack or Teams going on, you can automate something pretty simple and easy for very cheap, just a chat, a, a, a thread, you know, on Teams there that gives you an alert each time a gift gets processed, right? Or, hey, this just hit razor's edge. And then you can go in and just whatever process you're doing, give it a thumbs up if you've acknowledged them, whatever you want to do. The number of ways that nonprofits are using automation will blow your mind, right? And we're going to cover a bunch of them. If we have folks on the line that are going to BBCon, we have whole presentations on this coming up at BBCon in Denver. But automation is the name of the game. When we're talking about gift processing, there's some things that you want to use a vendor for. There's a lot of stuff that you can do internally as well. Um, if you have any questions about that, I'll put this on the screen. And Andy, let's get to, oh, oh sorry, oh, moving, moving quick. Andy, let's get to some questions, right? So what did, what did people want to know? That must have an auto, an auto advance. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Andy, what questions do people have? Let's go through some of that. Oh, we've got all kinds of them here. Uh, let's uh, start at the top. And I, I applaud and continue to keep the questions coming. Um, I mean, this is really my favorite part is being able to kind of, you know, help and kind of coach people through what's going on here. Um, the first question we have um, is, what kind of control do you have over how often checks are deposited and credit cards are processed, you know, using the lockbox? So in most situations, whether it be a financial institution or the, the printers or the gift processors that we talked about, uh, the intention is anything that is open that day has to be deposited. And that, again, as we get back to kind of compliance, they can't have open checks and financial information just kind of strewed about or like, under a keyboard or something like that until you get to it the next morning. So in most situations, the, the gifts would be processed every day. 
Um, you could work it out in, in a situation where you might only tell the, the lockbox processor only go to that PO box once a week and process everything in there, right? So that's where you would have the control there. Um, I do want to speak a little bit quickly about credit cards. And we, we didn't talk a lot about this, Nick, but um, as far as the credit card processing goes, um, in most of the pledge cards that we've designed or we advise people on, we do not offer an opportunity to actually write the credit card information in there. We say, you know, to make a gift via credit card, go to the website and do that. Because there again, we're taking a lot of that compliance kind of out of the equation. Um, and also we talked before about where you start to get dinged for those higher prices as keystrokes. If somebody's writing a credit card on there, credit cards have a lot of digits on there, right? So every single number that they have to put in on the credit card and the expiration date and a CCV number, you know, I mean, you're paying for each one of those keystrokes to happen. And so it really is probably more viable to not offer the credit card piece in yep. there and, and allow them to just the, the donor to do that online, you know, themselves. On that note, I'll ask if Rob in the background has that link. We did a whole webinar on how to design the perfect pledge card, and we go into a ton of detail about that, exactly how you should design it, why it's better to send them online, you know, versus writing in the information. So uh, as always, we've got a webinar uh, on almost any topic related to nonprofits uh, at this time. I just got asked to put that um, QR code back on the screen. We'll see if I can get it to work this time. Uh, mm -hmm. yoink. Okay. All right. Uh, the next question we have is... Um, working with the caging vendor who uh, uses in, uh, the encryption key to the bank. Um, and so we, we maybe talked a little bit about this, but in most lockbox situations, um, as they're processing the gift, you need to have access to that gift, right? They're not gonna send you that information. You know, they're not gonna email you an Excel document. So there are generally donor portals that exist where you would have, you know, MFA, uh, multi-factor authentication, you know, log in to get into it, or, you know, so there would be some sort of encryption that would allow you to access your lockbox portal, be it a bank or a, you know, a traditional processor or a printer or whatever that you would have, you know, password protected uh, access, you know, to the data that you would then be able to download that from a file, you know, an FTP site, a file transfer uh, portal um, onto your um, home desktop computer or whatever to actually import those gifts. So if there's anything other than that, I would not ever recommend doing that. You need to have, for your own sake, that data needs to be encrypted and, and, and really transferred securely. Uh, and the organization that's doing it for you would, would definitely say the same thing there. Yep. And your attorney will say the same thing. It's all about offloading risk, right? You don't want to be assuming the risk of encryption, right? These are It's a vendor that's serving you. They can handle and be responsible for the encryption. You can rely on them. A couple of good questions that came in. Um, uh, Joe asks, is Automate Geniuses a work with Virtuous? Uh, yes and no. Uh, probably more complicated question. Uh, set up a time to talk with Andy at that link if you want. It's built for our rate for, because all almost all of our clients are on Razor's Edge. So we built Automate Genius to help automate things out of Razor's Edge. Truthfully, any software that has an API, you can do automations. So whether we're the right ones to do it, or if we can just point in the right direction to get some things automated on your own, we're always happy to help. Um, uh, a question there from Robin, uh, as someone who works in gift processing and his husband's on the bank size, she's always amazed at the number of organizations who don't have their data in good shape, policies, procedures, completely agree. Uh, let's put Rob to the test. Rob, if you can find the link to, I think Austin, famous Austin Brown, who works for us, uh, did a wonderful webinar, might be our most popular one ever about cleaning your data, about how to go about it, what are the steps? So we'll share a link there. Um, Robin, great point. You have to have clean data. Um, otherwise, all of this is moot. Anyway, um, what do we got here? Andy, any questions? I'm, I'm going to keep clicking through here. Um, yeah, so I see uh, one from, from our friend uh, Meg. Uh, any recommendations about uh, the next step? So, you know, after after the gifts are basically processed, you know, getting it back into the system, right? So, uh, you know, most organizations are using Razor's Edge or, you know, they might be using Virtuous or Salesforce or something like that, right? So, the, the processing of the gifts is one piece of the puzzle, but the outcome of that processing is a data file that you, you need to import back into the system. So um, some people import that data file raw, you know, I mean, where they don't, they're not using any additional kind of software to do that. But when that data file is set up, it's set up with a lockbox processor so that the headers are very clearly mapped to the data fields that you want them to go to back in your system, right? So um, lots of organizations do 
that. Um, there was mention of Omatic, uh, it's a software provider. So they they have amazing names like Importacular. Um, and you know, so you're able to take the data files and import them into your system. And instead of having um, the data file kind of cleanly mapped as, as you might need to take that extra time to do on the front end, it allows you kind of you know, on the go to say, okay, I've got this data file, anything in this column goes to this field, anything in this column goes to this field, it does some of that interpretation for you. Um, so yeah. really either work. Yeah, and on that, I would just say, so if you're setting up with a vendor to do your Git processing, you should be able to work with them to get the output file from them in a condition that you can upload it straight into Razor's Edge. Like that should be a bare minimum stake. Importacular, uh, uh, Importomatic are wonderful software. That can help if you can't do that for whatever reason, they can be kind of a go between to massage data from one source to another. But you shouldn't just assume that you need to use one of those. That is not true, mm -hmm. right? If they're processing your gifts, they're going to output a certain way. Just work with them to make sure that it's outputted exactly the way that you want. So you can just click to upload it into Razor's Edge. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hit the comment from Andrea. She mentioned AQ2 is, is the company that yeah. uh, Andy mentioned as sort of if you're going to process internally, but you still want some of that software help because you might have a large volume. Andrew said AQ2 is amazing because it's customized and controlled by the client. Her concern is, is uh, anticipated volume of checks and whether it'll be worth the cost. So just, I wanted to share that comment. Again, PSG has no dog in this fight across the board. We do not endorse vendors. We just share when we have somebody that's done a good job. So Andrew, please make sure to let us know how that goes. Um, we've got questions here. Uh, Emily had a question about document retention. Andy, do you want to speak to that again? You I mentioned can, like yeah. seven years. So I will say, I will say first, and because this is recorded, I am not a professional tax advisor. <laughs> um, but I did stay at holiday on last night. No, I'm kidding. Um, so um the the seven years, where that comes from, um, and and it's interesting because we think of our own tax situation as individuals, right? Individually, we all pay taxes, right? Corporate tax is a little bit different. And so from a corporate record standpoint, corporate records are need to be retained for a longer amount of time. So that seven years doesn't necessarily come from, hey, I need to, you know, dust off my cedar chest because every gift that I've made to charities for the last seven years needs to be in there. But as a corporation, if I were a business owner, I would need to be able to produce up to seven years worth of transactions should I get audited by the IRS. And that's so that seven years is really where that comes from. So as your organization, which is a business, um, seven years is the number for individuals. Generally, it's it's three years because you're not going to get audited generally past that three year mark. Um, two questions from Noel that I love. So for clarification, when we talk about scanning, are we talking about they're scanning, Andy, the scan line on the remit or on the pledge card? Are they also scanning, you know, the information on the donor's checks? What what should we expect the lockbox to do? Yeah, so they will do both. Uh, they will they will capture the the scan line of the remittance card, and that data is actually sent to your data output file that ultimately you will need to import. They will also scan that check because that check is what is essentially their authorization to generate an EFT file and then process that so that my you know my individual financial institution is going to get a request of funds transferred from my from my institution to their inst institution using that you know ACH that check information right so the scanners generally will scan both the, you're not going to get the bottom of the check you know my personal check readout on your data file that's the financial institution that's going to capture that for their you know the financial transaction you're going to get the data output from the, the remittance card Yep. And on that note too, Noel, your question last, and then I'm going to share the webinars we've got coming up. Um, you can use your own payment, your, your own gift processor. So to be clear, like you don't need to outsource that decision. If you're using Blackwood Merchant Services, if you're using a bank or something like, you can tell the lockbox provider where to send that information. Like they're going to choose your bank. So don't make sure you understand that, right? Like their job is to open the mail, scan things, put it in the right spot, put it where you tell them to put it and then get you a, a file that you can use. So you're still in charge of, of how you're processing it. You can get you financially. You're still in charge of where those gifts are going and, and how you're processing the credit cards. Um, I want to share something here. Okay, so what's coming up next? Uh, all right, so we've got good webinars on tap. So I want to plug two of them coming up. Um, yoink, like this, what's coming up next? Uh, and September 20th, so you can sign up. So we have so many questions. We've gotten about giving societies. And by now, Andy, what is this? Like our 50th webinar we've done on different <laughs> topics? A lot. I can't imagine we haven't done giving societies yet, but we look back and we haven't. So we're going to talk about whether they work, 
if they do work, why and what's the best way to put them together. Um, so make sure to sign up for that. We're doing, we try and do about one a month. So Giving Societies is on tap. Um, mm -hmm. And the best place to learn about all this, if you attended this webinar, if you like this information, as rough and unvarnished as it is coming from us, uh, we do these all the time. So sign up for our fundraising newsletter. This is where you get alerts about anything that we have upcoming down the pipeline. We also put together templates all the time, template fundraising letters, template pledge cards, uh, template emails. We just try and be of service, right, to the nonprofit community that, that we love so much. So you can just go to askgenius.com, sign up for the fundraising newsletter. That way you will always get all of the webinars um, that we have coming up. With that, Andy, any last questions? We've got uh, three minutes left. Any any questions that we haven't covered in the chat or in the um, I just I think there's one here from Margaret. She just had you know, kind of I think asked you know is U.S. Bank a, a place that does this? And certainly they are. U.S. Bank and J.P. Morgan Chase are two you know very large. Wells Fargo, another one. They do these kinds of things. I would just caution you as to because they're very large organizations your ability to come in and say at my organization i need you to do all of these things and they're going to say we're us bank this is how we do things so right. it, not and i'm not you know knocking them in any way right like they have a very polished program this is what they do and there's just you might have a lot less input th there than you would at maybe a smaller financial institution or again some of these specialized gift processing organizations that we mentioned earlier i can't believe we made it through the whole webinar without me doing my usual plug and begging somebody to open up a gift processing shop on the West coast. I mean, <laughs> if, if you have, if you yourself are an entrepreneur, if you have a, a kid that's out of college and they don't, they haven't found themselves yet and you need them to get a real job, have them open a lockbox gift processing vendor on the West coast. We have so many clients that would immediately jump on board. Like we have large national nonprofits on mm -hmm. the West coast that are just absolutely foaming at the mouth for, to be able to not send their gifts to Connecticut or Baltimore or DC to be processed. They need it, right? Because it's sophisticated and they have a large volume. Open some, somebody, I mean, El Paso, me, right? Give me the yeah. Albuquerque, uh, <laughs> Orange if County, like Phoenix, I mean, anything. Phoenix. It would yeah. it would prevent them from doing the drop ship. And that's what they're doing is they're, they're having the donor send it to them and then they're taking it and then they're shipping it to the East Coast. So it still looks like your gift in California isn't going to Connecticut to be processed, but it, it slows down the processing considerably. Okay, so that is everything that we know about processing gifts, right? Whether you're doing it internally or if you're using a vendor, the pros and cons, what the vendors are like, some of the good ones that we've worked with. If you have questions, let us know. The email will come out from me uh, either later today or by tomorrow morning with the links to the slides and everything we covered. As always, we are an open book. If you have any questions, just email me. My, my, my information is on the website, same as Andy's. Mm -hmm. uh, let us know. We love helping people. Uh, happy to do pro bono advice if you want to know if you're working through a thorny issue, or chances are we can probably point you to some document we put together or a webinar we did on a topic. So let us know. Um, we appreciate you. Thank you all for joining us. Stay cool out there uh, and we'll catch you on the next webinar. Thanks everybody.